we're on to our last session of the day. Um, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we're on to our last session and session number eight, Fund Structures in Alma. Uh, David Pate is our presenter. He's the current head of acquisitions and electronic resources for the University of Texas at Dallas. David assisted with the migration from Alma to, to Alma from Voyager in the fall of 2013 as an early adopter. Uh, he has since assisted multiple institutions with acquisition and electronic migration issues. David is also a member of the Luna Analytics Working Group. Thank you very much. And awesome. let me see if I can switch this over real quick. Sure. Are y'all seeing me just fine? Yes. Okay. All right, so um, thank you again for having me here today. Uh, just a little bit about UT Dallas. I have to give her a little plug. Uh, uh, UT Dallas, we do have eight schools. We have 142 degree plans here at University of Texas Dallas. Uh, currently, we only have one main library. Uh, we have one special collections library and one off-site campus. We also purchase materials for a specialized library that's, while it's part of the university, it's not affiliated or under the, uh, the primary library. Um, we do have uh, over 28,000 students, uh, and currently my department has seven full-time staff in acquisitions and, any, and electronic resources, and currently about 80% of our expenditures are in uh, our own e-resource products. Uh, University of Texas at Dallas, we migrated to, uh, from Voyager to, to Alma in August of 2013 as an earlier adopter. Uh, to say it was a bumpy road is an understatement, but uh, with the, at the end of the day, with all the innovations that Alma has presented us, uh, we, we, we feel it's been well worth it on our journey there. Um, and so what I want to do today is I'm going to be covering uh, a couple of different areas. The first thing I'll be covering is uh, different fund structures on ledgers and summaries and allocated funds. Uh, also going to have some areas that we wish we knew before we migrated or that we discovered after migrating to Alma, and I'm going to share those with, uh, with you. And finally, there's a couple of bonus uh, tips that I would like to share uh, involving invoicing expenditures and uh, on changing vendors uh, that we uh, stumbled across and made a few mistakes on. Uh, with that in mind, uh, first of all, I want to uh, start sharing uh, our examples of different fund structures you might want to think about. Uh, while these structures are things that either we have implemented uh, at our university or I've assisted with other universities in implementing. Uh, this does not mean you have to do it this way. Uh, the fund structuring in Alma is, is uh, uh, very flexible. Uh, it's just things to think about. Uh, what I do uh, suggest is to look at um, how you want to do your fund structuring uh, uh, within SUNY before um, you complete your Alma migration. Uh, because uh, after the fact, it's kind of, uh, uh, trying to figure it out after the fact, it can kind of be a little chaotic during that time period. Uh, so just, you know, probably I've already figured this out, but Alma is a bottom-up fund, uh, fund accruing system. So basically you start out your allocated funds, it, it moves that information up to your summaries, and finally all the summary information moves up to your ledger. So uh, basically all your allocated funds have your, uh, uh, your purchasing funds within them. For the first example I want to talk about here is a campus structure. And what this is, is uh, basically the top level is either a campus or a, uh, or a library. And uh, then on the summary funds, you're dividing it out either by a discipline or a department. Um, and uh, underneath that, you can either just directly associate your subjects as you're allocated up to summaries 
or if you want to further subdivide it, you can also take a look at your material types. Um, I know a couple of institutions that had decided about doing it like this. I think UT San Antonio is one of them. I think SMU might have done it this way as well. So you may speak with one of those institutions if you're interested in uh, handling your funds in a similar fashion. Um, one note, it does take time to set up. So you want to think it through. You want to think about how your organization is on this. Um, and you want to think about on how far you want to subdivide your your subjects. You can subdivide, subdivide them uh, uh, as much as you want. The second structure, this is the one that we primarily use at our university. Um, it, it structures it around on material type. It makes it very easy uh, to figure out what our material costs are on specific material, material types. Um, the top level is, again, a campus library uh, ledger. Um, but then we subdivide by, between our monographic one-time purchasing and our continuous purchasing. Uh, we also uh, have a, uh, a summary primarily on our expense accounts as well. Um, our subjects are utilized as our allocated funds. And on our material types, uh, uh, we do use a secondary level of summaries uh, to uh, distinguish between both print and uh, electronic materials. Uh, the basic benefits of this, it does allow us to quickly um, assess um, our purchasing costs within specific uh, material types. Um, it, it does take a, a large amount of time to set up. Um, and uh, But one of the things about it is it is adjustable uh, and it can be adjusted uh, to fit different reporting objectives. Structure number three is a collection-based um, ledger. Basically, this is really good if you have a special collections. It's also good for endowments. Um, the benefit allows you to, uh, to spe uh, specifically track your specialized co uh, collections. Um, and also, uh, uh, for most universities, they may need to separate their endowment funds out where they're not part of the regular uh, campus expenditures or, or main library expenditures. And this allows you to kind of think that through in terms of setting up your endowments uh, uh, based upon either a subject or an endowment level. Uh, you will need to work with whoever is your analytics report coordinator if you set it up this way, uh, mainly because it does take a, a lot of work to integrate these type of uh, ledgers in with your main uh, analytics if you're trying to do like a very top level uh, fund information, uh, which you may have to have uh, do something like that for your annual reports. So just to be aware, it does take a little bit of effort to uh, integrate these type of uh, this type of information into uh, some top level reports. The final structure I want to talk about, this is kind of a, uh, this one was more of an organic structure that evolved at our university. Um, we um, started to obtain a, a, a flat level of funding from UT system, um, which basically, uh, it became kind of a consortium um, funding base for us. The level of funding was flat and never increased year to year. But we needed to figure out a way on how to track the funding or basically associate the funding from the system on our resources and at the same time as keeping that fund, those funds separated and independent from our primary or main, uh, our main ledgers. Um, also, uh, because the fl uh, funding is flat, uh, whenever there is a basically whenever a resource increases in price, the system does not match that increase. So there, of course, is gonna be shortfalls um, at the end of the year. Um, and so we need to be able to track that and move those um, extra expenditures basically to move it back and forth between either the, the consortium purchasing or the or, or local university uh, purchasing. So we developed this um, methodology. We basically created an internal workbook um, when we associated various material types to that workbook. And uh, we'll compile a large, basically a large invoice that we just basically improve and uh, approve that invoice internally. And uh, so that while we can keep track of it, keep track of expenditures, make sure that, you know, that whatever uh, shortfalls that we're going to encounter in the year, we're reserving that amount of funds for our, our system. Um, we're at the same time, able to uh, uh, get uh, 
different types of data like cost per use and other information that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to do um, had we just done this uh, outside of Alma. And uh, what I wanted to do is go over a couple of areas that you know we really wish we knew before we had migrated to Alma and what we figured out after we migrated. Uh, first thing involves fun codes. Um, what we found out is, of course, on, as far as uh, the fun names, you can change that as many times during a year that you want. Um, you can change it however you need it if you need to reach, uh, change your fun names. Ledger, uh, the fund codes, however, you can't change them. Um, so before you start um, associating your various purchase orders, especially your continuous orders uh, to your funds, make sure your codes are what you want them to be for the long term. Um, even after you uh, roll over year to year, you cannot change those fund codes without also having an, a lot of extra work being done. We found out after that, after our first rollover, we changed our fund codes for our continuous. And what happened was when we rolled over our POLs, they didn't associate to the funds. Again, uh, funds. And as a result, we had to manually assign each of our POLs again to our funds. And that was a lot of, lot of extra work. Fun rule uh, explanations. Uh, this is basically on uh, within funds. You're going to see a, uh, some rules that are allowed um, that you can set up, and you'll want to think about this on what you your intentions are and how uh, strict your basically your rules are, are within your university. Um, for us, we're fairly strict, so there's certain things that we have to do. Um, at the bottom of each fund um, is where these rules. Uh, are basically are situated at. Um, if you do change a ledger rule set, it does affect every single uh, fund, uh, both uh, uh, both the um, uh, 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 so basically every fund that uh, is associated to that ledger will be affected by that rule change. Uh, the first rule that we um, found out, and this is actually still still true, we we I actually had to do this. I think a couple of days ago, in fact, um, if you set your over expenditure allowed to know where you did not allow over expenditures, if for whatever reason you have a zero balance on a fund, uh, you will not be able to pay an invoice, um, even if the funds are already encumbered for that P uh, POL. So you can have funds that are fully encumbered, everything's good, but you go in and you try to uh, put an invoice in, it's going to say there's not enough funds. Um, so the workaround is to go ahead and just transfer a dollar in there. If you are allowed to have over expenditures, at least to a certain degree, you may also just uh, put a limited amount of over expenditures to avoid this issue. Uh, fiscal period review rules. Um, these are a couple of things that we uh, ha have started utilizing um, and are very, very helpful. Um, so uh, when you set up an encumbrance expenditure prior to fiscal period rule, um, it allows you to expend or and or encumber um, funds after you have rolled over, uh, but before the, uh, the official beginning of the fiscal period. So for example, um, if your fiscal period is set to uh, begin in September 1st, um, however, you roll over August 1st, this, you can set it up so that you could still pay if your, if your uh, procurement department or your university allows you to uh, go ahead and start paying in the next fiscal period, you can set it up so that you, uh, the system will let you do that. Um, otherwise, it will not allow you to pay for or, ex or encumber funds in the uh, fiscal period until the official date begins. Uh, this, this is kind of the opposite case. This is fiscal period um, where you're setting your rules uh, for the fiscal period and encumbrance uh, as a grace period uh, for both your encumbrance and your expenditure. If you uh, do not set this, basically after you've ro uh, rolled over, after you set your fiscal period, if it's begun September 1st, for example, uh, it will not allow you to pay for uh, 
or expend funds in the prior fiscal period um, for uh, so or encumber in the final f fiscal period this could be you could have credit memos or something that applied that you didn't get them until after the new fiscal period began or maybe something came in and you had some extra funds they say hey can you spend these funds um, in the old fiscal period this will allow you to do that so you can set it as a grace period and it'll allow you to expend those funds um, again had a couple of bits of uh, bonus information I did want to share with everybody. Um, the first one is, this is more of an annoyance um, uh, in our case, uh, and then it's something of annoyance I think several uh, universities have commented on. There's actually, if you have a, um, a suggest a topic or suggest an improvement within AMA, uh, you'll see that this one's still in there. Um, and basically what it is, whenever you add an invoice uh, to AMA, either if you manually add it or if you import the invoice, even if that invoice is in review, if it's not in approval, if you have not approved that invoice yet, it still expends the funds within AMA. So be aware of that. So because if you, you start comparing your uh, balances within your procurement system, such as PeopleSoft, or if there's a different financial software that you uh, that your university uses, uh, they're going to be off. You're going to look like okay, we have more money than than what we should. Where in truth, in fact, is is that it's probably because it's showing the expenditures already uh, in Alma, uh, and they haven't been fully, truly expended within the uh, university financial system. Final piece of bonus information, we, we really uh, ran across this one um, several times. Um, there is an option that you can add a job that allows you to change the vendor uh, within an order. Uh, you basically, you decide your source information on what the vendor was, your target information, what the vendor you wanted to change it to, and then you have your PO that you associate. So if you want to have a purchase order, a continuous that changed vendors, that's, you know, went from uh, Taylor and Francis to Sage, um, you can do that so that uh, you don't have to just close down the PO and start over again. Um, if you accidentally do not include your PO information, because it is optional, it's not actually required, you can accidentally change all the orders from one vendor to another. We accidentally did this with our EBSCO at one time and ended up changing about 800 orders and ended up having to go back and manually fix all of those. So just a little bit of advice um, from, to prevent a little bit of heartache there. Uh, this is my email address. Um, I hope that these tips and tricks uh, uh, help you out a little bit, and I hope it gives you some ideas in terms of how to structure your funds. And I'd like, I, I wanted to have a little shorter presentation because I figured there was going to be a lot of questions on this. Uh, so please open it up. Sure. So does anybody have any questions? You know, as, as someone who's not an acquisitions person, this is the one area that I'm like totally confused by. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um, that's okay. I don't work in acquisitions. <laughs> I'm sure people who do have questions. So I'll give people a couple minutes to type because I can't see if they're typing or not. Ah. We did have one comment that's uh, from, from Rebecca, who's, I actually understood that, thanks. <laughs> We've had a lot of conversations in studio of like, those of us that haven't been using acquisitions of like, what does this all mean? Okay. <laughs> so the, the, it's helpful. Well. It's still a lot to take in, but it's helpful. I do want to offer it up. I've been, uh, if y'all have things as you're going through your migration, whether it be on funds or other acquisitions related um, issues uh, post migration, uh, feel free to email me, feel free to call me because I'm, I'm, I'm open to help out with this type of stuff. Ah, and we got, we got a couple questions simultaneously. Yeah. Oh, they're good. Um, actually, two of, two of them are basically the same patient question. Both Trish and Ingrid wanted to know if you could combine or mix and match fund structures. Yes, you can. Um, this is not, this is not a, a, a 
uh, I basically did this on the presentation the uh, the simplest way I could. Otherwise, you could get real into really complex trees. So um, you could uh, start off, or if you uh, wanted to have subject funds and then divide them up into material types, you could do that. Um, if you wanted to come and incorporate all of it, if you just wanted to have one ledger and you wanted to somehow put in your endowments in with that main ledger, but just separate them out as a, a different summary, you're, you're welcome to do that. There is, that's one of the beautiful things about this. You can really do it however you feel, whatever best matches your institution, what your needs are. Okay. All right. We had a whole, from no questions to like five questions. No problem. Uh, Mark wanted to know, can you change funds from one fiscal year to the next? Um, the funds from uh, the way that that works on the uh, fiscal year um, is when you roll a fund or roll over, it will set it in that fiscal year period. Um, so it automatically associates the fiscal period with the funds upon rollover. Um, there's not really a good way to change it in the middle of fiscal period. You actually have to utilize that within the fiscal period itself. At least I haven't figured out a good way of doing it. So that's where you can have the rows where you can have your grace periods. Okay. Uh, Moira wanted to know if it's easy to change fund structures once you've started. Like once you've set them up, if you see it's not working, um, uh, you change it. You can. Um, I would suggest if you have chances to practice in the sandbox, I would do that. Um, we, uh, um, when we've had to change a fund structure, it's been normally we've had to start over with a new or a different type of ledger. That's where we've incorporated with like the special collections because that wasn't working well with that being that as part of the main funds. Um, so you can do that. Um, I don't know if it will on if you'd make drastic changes on how that would impact your, your fiscal period. If you do make changes, I would suggest to do it before or right at the period of your fiscal year rollover, because that's the easiest way to change things up. Okay. Maureen wanted to know if you had Alma integrated with your campus finance system, and yes. if so, do you have any advice on doing that? Um, we we kind of cheated a bit on how we did it. We did it. This will probably not work out for some other universities. Uh, we utilized our report codes um, to incorporate our fund information, uh, which allowed it to, um, and then our, our um, university campus uh, system, they basically utilize that report code information because that's always exported in XML. Um, file from Alma and then they were able to grab that and construct a program to pull that information to associate it quickly to uh, the correct funds. There might be some other ways to do that um, but we decided the easiest way. Um, so that's one thing for you to look at. Um, the other thing is to be very uh, uh, think about on um, your rules in terms of your the financial uh, system on uh, invoice duplication and own rules in terms of uh, the fund codes themselves uh, because uh, we, we've encountered a few issues that we cannot transmit more than one account and fund code uh, to uh, within one invoice uh, to the financial system because it'll lock it up. So that might be something that maybe just because our programmers on our campus side might not be as good to work that around, but that's one problem that they've had. Okay, we actually got like a flood of questions now. Good, no problem. So hopefully I, I'm going to get to as many as I can before we hit the end today. Mm -hmm. um, so Alan wanted to know, can each institution have more than one ledger, right? Yes. Uh, one for the campus and one for collections, for example. Yes, that is correct. You can, you can have as many ledgers as you feel like you want to keep track of. Okay, and Cynthia wanted to know, fiscal year question, uh, how have you set your ledger rules if you have one ledger that's on a different fiscal year than your other ledgers? Oh boy, um, we haven't had that issue, but I could see where that could come in. Uh, I'm thinking something like a grant or something. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, we have been lucky. We have not had to do that. That is a good question. It's one I cannot answer because I don't have personal experience with. Uh, so um, I would like to work with y'all if you encounter that. I'd like to see how that works because I, 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 that's a good question. Uh, Stacia wanted to know, um, we have one instance with four colleges. Do you know how the four different fund structures would be set up in that one instance? 
Okay, you have four instances with, I mean, you have one instance with four colleges. Um, does, e uh, does each college have its own um, uh, basically acquisitions department? Oh, we have to wait for wait for them to respond. Let's see. I mean, it sounds like something where you would just set up. Right. It would depend on the acquisitions right. department. You know, that's right. where if it's I, all I would, one acquisitions department. Or I would do one. Four I would separate do one. ones. Yeah. If you had four separate ones, you would not. Have, you would not have one. You would want to have four different ledgers. Okay. But if you have one acquisitions, then that that would be you. You just would need one. And then you could just divide it up by uh, summaries after that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gordon wanted to know if in a consortia can each member have different fund structures? Yep, that's the easy question. <laughs> uh, yeah, like some of these questions are, they seem like simple yes, no, and some of them seem like very complex. Yeah, you can, um, uh, you, you'll have to have somebody that's really good on the analytics side because if things are not apples to apples, uh, your reporting at the end is gonna be a little confusing. Okay, Trish wanted to know, did you say you can't change a fund on an order mid fiscal year? Um, you can't, no, you actually can change the fund mid, mid fiscal year. That is no problem. You can change any orders on the, on, on the funds on changing it. It's just, uh, if you go in and I think the different question was, I think it was a different question. It was, uh, if you, um, I'm trying to remember on what the prior question was, but yeah, you can change a fund at any point. Uh, from one to another. So um, the the problem is you can't change the fund codes though uh, for uh, uh, when you roll over. Otherwise it will not, roll, uh, your POLs won't roll over correctly. Lisa wanted to know, would you recommend the simpler the fund structure, the better? Um, you can, I mean, yeah, you, you, uh, simple always works. Uh, it, uh, the The whole, the whole in purpose is, is what is it that you're trying to achieve out of your fund reporting? Um, you, you'll want to structure it based upon what, what is your end goals? What information do you need? What do you have to report back? Is there something that, uh, and structuring your funds accordingly to that would probably be a good idea. Okay. Um, Ingrid wanted to know, if I remember correctly, you can assign statistical cat categories to funds. Would you recommend them instead of a complex structure? Statistical, I would have to be defined on that because I, I, I'm not quite sure what that, what the, what the, what they're meaning on that. Okay, we'll wait for them to type in because I'm not sure. <laughs> That's the one disadvantage to like this QA thing is like mm -hmm. there's no chat, so it's like I don't know when they're typing, so it's I'm waiting for response. Um, in the meantime. Um, I'll skip while we wait to hear back. Um, Maggie wanted to know, is it easier to change if you go from simple to more complex versus complex to more simple? Yeah, it is. Uh, you can always, you, it's always better, it's always easier to expand than to, than to contract okay. uh, w within the funds. Uh, Claire wanted to know, can you delete a fund without altering payment history or is the fund there for life to avoid losing information in the PO? Um, once, okay, here's the thing. Um, uh, you can delete a fund up until you've associated uh, some type of purchase order lines and approved something within it. As soon as you've approved an invoice that's associated with that fund, it, it is there permanently. Now you can close, uh, you can close the fund, but you can never delete it. It'll just always be there. It will always be there. Okay, Ingrid, Ingrid clarified. I, they were thinking of report categories. Okay, for um, uh, right. Uh, if you uh, if you wanted to set up, because you have three levels of report codes that you can utilize, and that is one way of handling things. If you rather have it um, handled just through report codes rather than through the fund code system on your reporting, you can do that. Okay. And so we'll have, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Carmen said, it looked like you had different structures for monographs versus continuous yes. resources. Um, does this present any issues in analytics when running reports across both types of materials? Um, I have not encountered it. Um, I, uh, I separated the continuous and the monographs out uh, to um, allow for uh, a little more granular uh, granularity between what our our uh, ongoing commitments were versus our one-time commitments. Um, so far, I haven't had any issues. Okay. 
Um, and Susanna just pointed out in the in the Q&A, more is a comment. She says, Alvin documentation says the fiscal year is set at the ledger level. It applies to all funds within it. Right, if right. you have different funds with different fiscal years, I believe the recommendation is each one needs its own ledger. Yeah. I guess that's to answer the question about the different, right. two different fiscal years. Yeah, um, the, yeah, that's that's something I have not had to, uh, had to do yet. So I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of thankful for it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much again for having me here today. Oh. And if there is any, uh, if anyone has any additional questions or uh, please feel free to email me. I'm always interested in this stuff. I'm going to just do a little bit of a quick wrap up. So we've hit the end of our conference day. Um, I just want to thank our conference team one more time. Um, they've been kind of running around in all of our separate locations. <laughs> We're spread out all throughout the state, um, sort of making sure that everybody is up and running and uh, things are taken care of. Um, so I just want to thank, again, uh, Michelle Eichelberger at Genesee Community College, Roseanne Humes at Nassau Community College, uh, Bill Jones at SUNY Geneseo, Jill Lacasio who, at SUNY Optometry, who's our chair this year, and Carrie Martin at SUNY Purchase. Um, you guys have been awesome, and I've loved working with you guys for the last five years. Um, and thank you also to all of our presenters who presented today. These were all super useful, helpful presentations. And I think SUNY and the wider migrating to Alma and in Alma communities will find this really useful information. Um, once again, we are putting recordings of these sessions. They've all been recorded throughout the day. They will be available on the SUNY Law website, sunylaw.org in probably a couple of weeks. Um, need a little time to, you know, cut them down from the big recording and get them up, but they should be up in a couple of weeks and we will try to get the slides from the presenters to put those up because there were several requests for copies of just the slides. Um, I also want to make a last pitch for uh, SUNY Law 2019, which the theme of the conference this year is the big migration and the challenge of change. Um, June 12th through the 14th at Onondaga Community College in Syracuse, New York. Um, a lot of us, we're going to, SUNY is migrating around the time of that conference. So it's going to be, everyone's going to be kind of in Alma Primo mode. Um, the deadline for the call for proposals is February 22nd. Um, and there's more information about that on SUNYlaw.org. There is also going to be a post-conference survey that will go out. Please take a couple minutes and fill it out because it helps us figure out what to do for next year and helps us figure out what we can do better to improve. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, Thank, thanks for coming. <laughs>